Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now I start recording. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Shoshana Vodak, for those who don't know me, and I'm in Brussels at the Center for Structural Biology, the Vic Bay Bay Center for Structural Biology. Okay, so uh, today's program is here. So I will do a short introduction and then we'll have a talk by Bjorn Walner, Alpha Fold with Aggressive Sampling Using Dropouts. And uh, the second talk by Peter Fedolino, uh, DI Tasser Integrating Deep Learning. I took the title you know, from, from his paper at the CASP. I, I guess it would be something similar. And then we have a round table discussion and we discuss about the next meeting. Okay, so my introduction is, is, is uh, rather short. The two studies we're going to hear today are about improving, uh, uh, about improving the prediction of single structures or binding mode or a binding mode by creative uses of alpha fold the uh, multiple sequence alignments and other means that extensively sample protein conformations. So these studies raise interesting questions. For example, could such extensive sampling approaches or similar ones that also use alpha fold to be used, uh, be used to effectively sample alternative pro protein conformation, not just a single structure aiming for a single structure. Now, why is this a possibility? Obviously, sampling with physics-based method, enhanced sampling, metadynamics, and all, you know, a whole slew of other methods is inefficient and costly. Leveraging the evolutionary information in, in, in MSAs with the likes of AlphaFold, not alone, but with the likes of AlphaFold, may guide the sampling towards physiological confirmation that cannot be sampled by physics-based method because of the barriers that may, may separate them and the, the longer time, time scales that are needed. Now, is this assumption correct? And if so, how do we go about doing this? Now, the other aspect is efficient sampling of alternative confirmations is not enough, obviously. Adequately scoring them remains a bottleneck and this bottleneck is also addressed by the two studies. So let's uh, go and hear these studies. I will stop sharing. So Walner, Bjorn, it's your your turn. Okay, thank you. I will share the screen, I guess. Share. Okay, that was the summary. Okay, going backwards. Okay. So um uh, I saw that there was like a pre-request to see the CASP uh, presentation, but uh, since uh, I'm not sure everyone followed that, I will just have a few slides on the actual method. Uh, uh, so also for with aggressive sampling. So the motivation for, uh, for this method uh, was that we, we saw that the scoring function in alpha fold was very good. But when we tried to use uh, apply this to um, modeling <laughs> peptide docking. Excuse uh, me, pe people should uh, mute themselves, please. I guess you can do it as host. Yeah, as well. you can. You can maybe Arne, you can do it. Yeah, I'm trying. I don't know who is not muted. I'll try to fix. Okay. Okay. Great. So yeah. So we, so, but we noticed that uh, when we wanted to apply AlphaFold to modeling, in particular, uh, interaction with peptides, which are inherently flex flexible, we wanted to we needed to in in increase the, the diversity. So that's where we sort of came up with this method, uh, because when we just run it uh, at the face value, we just got five five identical models basically. So. Um, and the, the way we you can sort of using it as a sort of a more more or less a black box like everyone is doing get more uh, diversity out of alpha fold is to, of course to generate uh, more structures, uh, but with some uh, random perturbations in various uh, ways. Uh, so of course you can uh, perturb the input and subsample or change the templates or. Uh, 
and other types of perturbation, we choose to uh, turn on the dropout layers at inference, so it's more internal perturbation, but in, 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 a, in a sense, it's sort of all some kind of perturbation to the problem. Uh, and um, in this way, we are, we are then able to run the alpha fold many times and then generate the, getting different solutions. And our goal was all, always just to get a higher score, basically. So that's where we, we sample until we reach sort of a high score using the ranking confidence in this case, uh, which, we, which is a relatively good measure. So uh, for CASP, we, we, we just decided to use six different methods. So we use uh, our versions or settings for, the, for running it. So we're using the Multimer version one, which actually I think was a good choice. I will tell you about that later. Uh, and also version two that we're out done. Uh, and then we use template and uh, dropout in all cases. And we have two versions where we run a little bit longer. Uh, and uh, as I said, all of these came from our studies using peptide docking, which is um, where we actually need the, the flexibility and generate the... Uh... Okay, uh, good. Uh, and it actually turned out that when we, when we analyzed the result, the models originate from all of it was useful to run it in different ways because the best uh, models came from different places. So it was not only one that was best all the time, or at least ranked one model. Uh, and yeah, let's keep going. And this actually, when we then compare to the baseline method run on identical input, it was like a huge improvement in performance. So this was our, uh, we were quite happy with that uh, on identical input. So. Uh, now the question is when you when you when we have generated these large ensembles on the order of like uh, not in, they are not really particularly large but then in, in it, they are larger than five or twenty five like on order, on the order of six thousand models or so uh, the question on the correlation between the ranking confidence and doc Q came up uh, I know I actually showed some of these plots at the conference but they were not really docu measurements they were based on team score uh, so they were a bit maybe not optimal for that. So the ranking confidence is this uh, linear combination of the in of the interaction uh, score and the overall score with a heavy weight on the interaction. Uh, so and here is one example here where the actually version one has a very poor correlation and uh, version two very good correlation. However, they they both select the best <laughs> similar model in terms of quality. Uh, I looked at the correlations on uh, between ranking confidence and docu. This is just a histogram or something like a density plot uh, over uh, how uh, frequent uh, different correlations are obtained per target. So this is per target correlations. So there seems to be a slight uh, sort of bias for version one to have better correlations with docu, which is the measure I used. Uh, but as I also noticed when I looked at this, the four CASP targets that were exceptionally successful all originated from version one predictions, which I thought was a bit uh, remarkable. Uh, so this was one of the targets that were very successful. I, now I show this is um, MM, I call it MM score because it's MM aligned, but it's sort of TM score. Uh, and now I recalculate this with docu. So this is now with the six different settings and uh, so if you overlay all of these plots, it's basically this plot, but with a different y-axis. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and uh, all the high scoring ones, or, uh, so, so these ones here, are coming from version one. And the sa same thing with, um, uh, with another one. Same thing here. And uh, these ones that, Actually, in here with, with team score, it has sort of a tendency to score. Even if you have, if you are one of the subunits correct, it will you will get a high baseline score. So the baseline is way too high for uh, this MM score. Uh, so now when I rescore it with Docu, it has slightly it's better sort of trend at least. But again, all all models uh, correspond. Uh, the best ones comes from version one, not version two. This one as well. This big uh, large protein here. Uh, same thing here. Uh, more or less all of them are coming from, or not all, very few but that are good, but they are all coming from version one. 
Uh, yes, and this is the one that maybe, um, yeah, exactly. Also, same thing for this one. So, for sampling, um, version one seems to be really quite useful, and something we also saw that, uh, when we do did this for peptide, and that's why that's why we decided to actually use it because it's one. Uh, but then, in terms of correlation, maybe the version two version two is better, or making. Uh, on models that doesn't clash or something like that. However, uh, correlation is not everything. So here are some examples. I mean, you can see you can have a poor correlation overall, but still in terms of selection, you're, you're still pretty good anyway. Uh, of course, if you're doing sampling, it's good that you have a decent correlation so that you can you know if you're improving or not. So it's of course, it's good to have a good correlation. And here you can see that version two uh, has excellent correlation here, 0.92. This one doesn't, but it's probably it's just because it doesn't have any bad models. <laughs> so it's like you need bad models to generate a good correlation. So it's it's a bit of a, I don't know. It's um, yeah, maybe overall correlation is not the best measure. Uh, then up to the question if you can generate like alternate confirmations. Uh, so I, I just looked at some of the scatter plots I generated with all the confirmations and see so where you have this situation where you have a, like a high ranking confidence and uh, poor docu score. So it's it's like it's not close to your reference. Uh, that could of course indicate that you're completely wrong, but it could also indicate that your reference uh, that the, the, you should have another reference or there's an alternate confirmation uh, if you trust the score. So for, uh, so for this particular case, I just looked at this top one here is the correct or the reference, the, <laughs> the native structure that we're, we were supposed to predict in CASP, this is the, this CASP target. Uh, here is the one that scores a little bit lower. These are these points here, it's here. So it's sort of, it's a different sort of, <laughs> they are slightly different, but still it's sort of a more open confirmation than this one. But, um, if it, that's right, uh, correct or not, I have no idea. And I think that's a, um, uh, a problem as well because we don't have these uh, intermediate alternate confirmations uh, all the time. Uh, sometimes we do have the, have them. I mean, in particular for membrane proteins, there could be open and closed confirmation. This is not multimer version now, but it's you can of course run the same sampling principle to. Or, or, or I mean the regular monomer version of AlphaFold. So I tried it here. This is uh, uh, transporter proteins, uh, amino acid the transporter. So uh, where I run it, uh, it has two confirmations in the PDB that we know. So this confirmation here, this confirmation here. And what I'm plotting here is the TM score against this guy mm -hmm. on the y-axis and the TM score against uh, that guy on the x-axis. And you can see there's like a, uh, it both it's both able to predict structures close to this guy and structures close to this guy. And not only that, because since it is like a pretty smooth transition as well, so then you can imagine that you have structures that you can sort of jump in between in some uh, in some way and then generate sort of some kind of transition between, in this case, the open and the closed confirmation. Uh, so that sort of made me curious. I just made a small movie of that when I sort of put stitch this together based on the closest uh, neighbor. Anyway. Here you can actually also see that they are able to pick this up based on ranking confidence. So you have a, this is now um, uh, on the x-axis. I have the TM score uh, worth to the first ranked model, which is something which is something you can calculate uh, even without having a true, true structure. And then you can see that you have one, of course, that's close here, and then you have another sort of uh, maxima in the scoring function. So you can pick up both of these uh, confirmations from the scoring as well. I'm so, gonna... Okay, so when, when I did this movie, this is how it looks. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, dynamics, but it's moving. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if it's uh, true either, but it's like you can at least and it's quite few here in the between, in the between so that's why it's a bit slow. Uh, I have another one which is a bit more, uh, uh, I don't know, interesting, but at least uh, funny. Uh, it's the same type of situation where you have one open closed confirmation uh, and, uh, and the same plot, the, 
similarity to this guy on the x-axis and similar to that, that guy on the y-axis. And it's actually able to predict both closeness to this guy and the other one as well. But then it has this other thing down here as well, which is not close to anything. Uh, so that was a bit uh, funny. So when I did the same type of movie, what that is is some kind of open confirmation, or maybe it's just an intermediate or an artifact from the sampling. Uh, but it could also be something that's uh, relevant. So then it's a more open confirmation that is then closed, and then it reaches this one, which there is a crystal structure for, and then it goes to the other one down here as well, which is the close to that guy. Uh, no idea if this is uh, biologically relevant, this open confirmation, but um, it, it really likes that confirmation at least. So that's, <laughs> so it's an hypothesis. Someone can check it if it's uh, uh, possible. Uh, or if it's just some artifact of the sampling. But the fact that it actually likes it, yeah, at least it's some indication that might be useful. So just to sum up is that the sampling is clearly useful, of course, that has been, I mean, it's obvious now when you say it, of course, that you should use, you should sample more, uh, in particular, since the scoring function is so good. So of course, in making that better, I mean, improving that is useful by itself. And you can do it using different things. I think use in particular, I think this was maybe, maybe surprising that using actually the old version of the, the weights was good. Uh, and since I, in CASP, I did not use anything. I only used internal dropout and, and uh, use identical input for to allow for comparison with the baseline method. So I didn't do any sampling or a couple of things together. So that could probably be improved even further. I mean, the, the nice thing with the dropout is that it's so easy to just apply and then you get it for free more or less. Uh, the, the way we do sampling can certainly be improved. It's a bit, a bit stupid now. I mean, everything is dependent. You don't, even if you performed well in one, for one particular run, you just start a completely independent one with not even considering the, that you were good before. So the sampling is, can certainly be improved, but uh, that's uh, future research, I guess. Yes. So with that, I end. Thank you. This is just okay. really exciting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> really, really interesting. I mean, your, your last case, you know, you had basically mm -hmm. a two domain, more or less a two domain protein. So it's not, you know, this case, it really yeah. looks yes. two domain. Yeah, this right? is just a membrane protein. This is a membrane protein. So right. So maybe it's know, just an artifact. I don't know. It but kind of makes it's, sense. I mean, yeah, it makes, uh, intuitively. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, it should open up to transport something. Yeah, yeah, to a yeah, so, yeah. So maybe yeah. it's something that can be shaped yeah. or done, but it's yeah. like, yeah. So, but I think that's what, what we need to have. We need to have some kind of, I mean, we need right. to have data to right. shape these things. So that's the, yeah. So is, it would be really interesting to have a benchmark of, of a number of these cases that you can mm -hmm. try to see, you know, what's going on. And that's something we, we will discuss in the in the other SIG, you know, you know, in, in yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. But I think yes. this could be key if you have enough of these, you know, benchmarks, I mean, be benchmarks, even, you know, even if it's structures that have already been solved. Yeah. Just to see if you can if if you can sample without the uh, without the uh, uh, the templates. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this this was obviously run without templates. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, of yeah. course, this was run without templates. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Any any other question? The questions are for later, right? Yeah. I, I guess Shoshana's question in the chat about what is the difference between version one and version yeah, two. Yeah, I forgot be... now. You know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe so, you can say a few words about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can say a little bit. Yeah. So, so uh, they realized that version one was, uh, it, it was sort of more, uh, it allowed uh, models to overlap a little bit. Uh, yeah. And, and you could get clashing models and so on. So then they retrained it uh, with, a more, with a higher penalty. At, at least that's what you can read up with a higher penalty for clash. Uh, so that's why, I mean, I, so my take on this that it's not as good for sampling is a, bit, a little bit the analogy to what you had with soft repulsive and so on because then you then you have a more soft repulsive term for for sampling because you don't want to be too strict when you when mm -hmm. you sample mm -hmm. uh, and maybe version one has sort of like a soft softer penalty for that and so allow more, I see. I more see. flexibility. That's just I mean <laughs> just something that uh, I mean. 
I mean, has been I mean has been used when using Rosetta, for instance. Then you then you then you have this uh, you ramp the re repulsive and you ramp it down to make it more soft, so you can actually I mean sample the space better. Uh, no, I I mean this is not a physical scoring function, but you try to make right, the right, connection, right, but right. it's still like right. yeah. You know, now can 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 you say something about you know something which I I I don't I wanted always to understand is the are the uh, the uh, predicted TM and IPTM how are they calculated what is you know how exactly what what do they use to calculate these uh, they, they use the they use the predicted uh, probability distributions for the errors. For the errors, okay. So it's and basically it's based, it's based on what? On also on the MSA or not? Uh, I mean, that's one of the outputs you get. It's like the, it's it's not the, it's it's the it's the uh, this predicted aligned error before it's flattened. So the predicted aligned uh, uh, aligned error is the expected value of this thing where they use, <laughs> which they use. So. Okay, you can so sort of case, you can sort yeah. of recalculate it from the predicted aligned error. It's not identical, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. the predicted aligned error is just the expected value in each point. Mm -hmm. But internally, they have a whole distribution, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like, a, yeah, like, yeah, a, yeah. like a histogram, yeah. and they use that. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a formula. Mm -hmm. So it's basically it's just that the, the difference between IPTM and PTM is that IPTM is for the, the sum goes cross chain uh, yeah, and cross chain, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, one problem there is that it 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 it's only cross chain, but you might have multiple chains, and then it's cross chain all over the place. So you might yeah. want to do it per chain interface. Otherwise. Like I mean, yeah. because yeah. it's like yeah. all yeah. the chains. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's so the sum goes cross chain, and not just. I mean, if you have three chains, then you have of course many different combinations. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. bit, but yeah, but okay. So uh, that you have to you have to be careful what what's going on. And then the other thing with that one is that. Again, this 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 TM score uh, yeah. thing that cake, cake com, comes in here as well. This TM score uh, threshold for this D zero comes in. So for large thing, you might you might get uh, strange things. Actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. There is some, some another question in the chat. Maybe maybe, maybe take it late. Yeah. Otherwise, we have yeah, to take yeah, it okay. a bit late. But, It's Peter's turn now. All right, great. Um, let me Thank share you. my screen. Yes. All right. Uh, I had to switch computers just two seconds ago because one of them was crashing. So, you know, the joys of technology. Um, is my presentation window showing up okay? Okay, thanks. Another title. Good. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, another title. And, and really, the way I've structured things, actually, I, I'm working under the assumption that people had um, taken a look over the um, past talks. So I'll just give like a, a, a very brief overview of methods and then actually focus on there were some really excellent questions that uh, Shoshana and Arnie um, sent ahead of time. And so I'm going to focus on those, actually, and answering Thank you. those. Okay, um, great. Exciting. <laughs> so um, just to help get people on the same page first, though, I think it's useful to go back to what are the methods that we are using here. And we have fairly distinct methods that were used for the um, single chain predictions versus the um, multi-chain predictions. Um, oh, sorry, before I get into all this stuff, I just want to make sure I acknowledge um, the other folks involved in this work. Um, so Wei Zhang and Kikiji Wuyun were the ones who were actually on the CASP team. Wei, in particular, is the one who did this Herculean work of actually finishing the pipelines and running everything. Um, and Yang Zhang has been working on all of these methods for decades at this point, and so they're all absolutely instrumental in um, everything I'm going to talk about. Um, so we have um, one pipeline for single chain predictions, one pipeline for multi-chain predictions. Again, I will go through this fairly quickly, both because um, people have probably already seen the cast talk and also because I'm going to hit some really key points in the course of answering Shoshana and Arne's questions. Um, so for the single chain uh, modeling, which was our um, so-called UMTBM server, the very quick version of this is um, we get a highly diverse set of multiple sequence alignments using our new deep MSA2 package. We just submitted the paper. And so as soon as that's accepted, we'll be posting all the code and the data and the code for generating the databases and everything online. Um, and then we use the um, we use a, a quick version of AlphaFold 2 to score the different multiple sequence alignments and ultimately pick a multiple sequence alignment that we're going to use. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, 
And then we use uh, the LOMETS3 pipeline to identify good threading templates, both for the whole protein and for each individual domain that we're able to identify in the protein. This becomes important for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, we use the templates from uh, LOMETS as the uh, template inputs for AlphaFold when we're actually getting our distance constraints, um, our distance potentials. Um, and second, um, we can assemble the domain level threaded structures in order to get starting confirmations for the Monte Carlo uh, simulations that we ultimately do. So then we use the multiple sequence alignments plus our template structures in three different deep learning based pipelines. Um, and the most notable of which is probably AlphaFold 2, but we have three separate deep learning based pipelines to get distance maps, contact maps, and for one case, also hydrogen bonding potentials. Then all of these potentials that we're getting from the deep learning pipelines, in some sense, this is the AlphaFold contribution in our, in our case. And I want to be very clear that our sampling is completely orthogonal to AlphaFold 2 for this particular pipeline. So we're taking all of the potentials that we get out of the deep learning pipelines. We are taking the template structures that we're able to identify via threading as starting structures. And then we're putting these into basically ITACER simulations, which people have been seeing for a long time. So these are uh, replica exchange, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations, using as potentials a mixture of the deep learning derived contact maps and hydrogen bonding potentials, and also some of the classical knowledge based and uh, energy potentials that you would have seen in old DR TASER simulations. And so from this point, it looks just like old school ITASER, um, where you sample a bunch of confirmations uh, using a physics approach that is also informed by the deep learning. And I think that's very important when we get to some of the questions that Shoshana is interested in, in terms of sampling, that there's some built-in physical sampling that, that in a sense understands things like entropy here. Um, we end up clustering those confirmations. We take a cluster centroid from the most populated cluster and refine it, and that's going to be the predicted structure. Now, very different is the um, multimer pipeline that we ended up using because this is much more heavily just driven by AlphaFold 2 multimer right now. And I want to come back to that notion later because one of my challenges is how do we merge these two things? Um, but the way the multiple pipeline is looking, it begins again with deep MSA2, which gives us these high, very high quality multiple sequence alignments. By quality, I just mean depth, lots of information content. And we found that is super important. Um, and so we end up then with a set of multiple sequence alignments for each of the um, monomers that is potentially involved in the oligomer we're interested in. And then we try many different pairings of the multiple sequence alignments for entity A, entity B, entity C, and so on, where those are the various protein identities that are present in the oligomeric complex. We use those as the, as the multiple sequence alignments going into AlphaFold Multimer, and then we end up ranking based on the quality metrics coming out of AlphaFold 2 Multimer in order to pick our final structure. So that's the like flyby version, maybe only slightly faster than what I did, what I did during CASP, because I know I spoke fast during that presentation as well. I'm going to delve into some of the questions that were asked, and I'm very happy to go into more detail on other particular points of these things later, once I address what I think were the key um, conceptual points people wanted to raise. So first question um, that I got um, from the kind of pre-prepared ones was, could you elaborate about the differences between the confirmations sampled by the different multiple sequence alignments that we used? And so I want to, first of all, point out this is, the way we're using the multiple sequence alignments is actually quite different in a couple different contexts. So I'd like to talk about how we use them in all cases. The first thing we have to do with the multiple sequence alignments is just pick which one or ones are we going to use. In our end, usually what DeepMSA2 is going to give you is a ranked set of multiple sequence alignments where for the monomer pipeline, we're only choosing one. And so in the selection stage, so we run DeepMSA2, we get a set of candidate multiple sequence alignments. We use AlphaFold2 um, with uh, no templates in order to predict a structure based on each of our 10 candidate multiple sequence alignments or up to 10 candidate multiple sequence alignments and choose the MSA that gives us the best PLDDT score because AlphaFold is pretty good at knowing when it's doing a bad job. So we can actually use that to rank the information content of our multiple sequence alignments with regards to protein structure prediction. So in some sense, we're not doing any structural sampling using the multiple sequence alignments here. We're just using the deep learning pipeline to tell us which multiple sequence alignment do we want to use. 
Then when we move on to, and then we're, we're just going to be using that, that one multiple sequence alignment in the monomer pipeline, and all of the conformational sampling is really coming from the different threading templates and then the Markov chain Monte Carlo. Now, in the case of the multimer pipeline, we are trying out different multiple sequence alignments, and in particular, for each of the involved entities, we've got a set of ranked multiple sequence alignments, and we try as many different combinations as we can afford of the multiple sequence alignments for chain A, chain B, chain C, and so on, um, as the overall joint multiple sequence alignment that's going into alpha fold multimer. So we end up with many different potential concatenated multiple sequence alignments of the individual chains. We then generate 25 models for each of these. And so our sampling in this case comes from running alpha fold multimer with each different combination of the single chain multiple sequence alignments. We have a cap on how many we'll do. We'll do no more than 100 um, different combinations just for the sake of computational complexity. And so unlike the monomer case where I really can't tell you what we would get for conformational sampling with the MSAs because we didn't do it, in this case, we do actually have the sampling informed by the different multiple sequence alignments. And I think it's instructive to look at a couple of the nanobody cases that were coming out of the CAS-15 competition. Um, and so what I've got um, shown here for each of uh, these cases are the um, predicted TM score and then the actual TM score or the F1 score. Um, and this is across all of the different conformations that we're sampling using this approach of try many different pairings of the single chain multiple sequence alignments prioritized by that ranking that we did before with the alpha fold monomer pipeline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we rank them based on the PTM. And what I think is really important to see about this sampling is most of the sampling is quite bad, um, both in terms of the predicted and the actual TM score. So we've got a big crowd of points over here, and we end up with a relatively sparse population of points that happen to have a high predicted TM score. Fortunately, those also turn out to be the best models in this case. And, and that's not always the case. I'll talk in the challenges I want to get into at the end um, about some uh, cases where that is, in fact, a problem and where the scoring can definitely be improved. Um, so I, just, I, I didn't see what time I started. Um, when should I aim to be done with just my segment so I can pace myself accordingly? Go, go ahead. We'll see. <laughs> okay. But so you can cut me off whenever then, and, and then we can yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So second question I got was that our method alternates between physics-based sampling and alpha-fold predictions. Can I clarify the steps and explain a bit more what was the role of the physics-based methods in converging to the correct single structure? And so I'm going to build on what I said a couple of minutes ago and just so point out, first of all, this question is only pertinent to the monomer pipeline because in mm -hmm. the multiple pipeline, we're only using alpha fold for the sampling. But in the monomer pipeline, um, it really is the physics-based simulations, the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations, that is getting us our set of confirmations to cluster and refine and ultimately get our one final confirmation. So all of the sampling is coming from this physics aware method, but it is informed by the deep learning based potentials. And so I think this is this is the fusion at least that we have taken. And I would like to say, I think this is a very promising uh, potential way to go in the future for trying to model ensembles, for example, and for trying to get um, an orthogonal way of sampling besides just what the deep learning is able to do because we've got some real physics in here and because we've got a, a, a sense of conformational entropy that's enforced by the um, Marco Che Monte Carlo. Now, um, as far as performance contributions go, this is something that we had shown during CASP, but it's worth coming back to where we compared for different uh, sets of targets, uh, performance that you get with just alpha fold two, AlphaFold 2 plus the LOMETS threading, AlphaFold 2 plus LOMETS plus adding in the deep MSA 2 based MSAs, and then the full pipeline. And so what separates the third and fourth violin in each of these cases are two things. Um, one is the hybridization of potentials from the three different deep learning pipelines. Um, and the other, which I think is a larger contributor, is the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations for conformational sampling instead of just using AlphaFold 2. So to a large extent, the difference between this and this is what the physics-based approach is bringing in. So the next question, um, what exactly was the role of templates in our approach? Um, and this, again, is different between the monomer and the oligomer pipeline. 
So in the oligomer pipeline templates, sorry, in the monomer pipeline, I'm sorry, um, templates come up in a couple of different places. The two main ones being, and these are all identified by LOMETS3, which is published, but the two main places the templates come in are, number one, the templates enter into the distance and contact map calculations with AlphaFold2 because the threading-based templates are what are getting used as the template structures. It's not just whatever AlphaFold2 would have come up with. Those are getting used as the templates for running AlphaFold2. The other place where the templates come in is they serve as our starting confirmations for the replica exchange Monte Carlo calculations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I have a little bit here that I think I can skip over. So if I have a moment, I was, I was hoping to give my two cents on a couple of what I see are key challenges moving forward, but if we should instead move to open discussion, that's fine as well. I don't want to monopolize the time. Go ahead. Okay, so um, one challenge I think is, it, this is a really obvious short one, um, we would really like to move to doing this Markov chain Monte Carlo for multimers as well as monomers. We only didn't do it in CAS 15 because of the time requirements. I think there's a lot of potential benefits in terms of doing physically realistic sampling. We see it really helps for the monomeric calculations. The problem, of course, is, is mainly one of compute time. So I think this is a really obvious thing that can be addressed to move toward ITASER-like simulations, at least for the direction we're going to try to go um, for uh, multimeric predictions. So another area that I think is interesting to consider is homoallogomeric structure predictions, because while we didn't see this for the CAS-15 targets, in some cases we have found that when we're doing oligomeric structure prediction, we do worse on homoallogomers than on heteroallogomers. And this is especially somewhat surprising because the MSA pairing problem, some of the linking problems of linking the, the different um, sequence identities in the different multiple sequence alignments for monomers, that problem goes away for homoallogomers. And so this feels like it should be an easier problem. But the reason I think this is an issue, and we found there are a few cases of this that you can really point to, is there are some cases where the inter-monomer contacts contaminate the contact maps that you get from the deep learning pipelines and probably confuse those pipelines to some extent. So this is just one example. Um, this is a deep potential based um, contact map and that's one of the deep learners that we use. And so there's a set of contacts here that cannot be satisfied within a single monomer. So this is the actual dimer structure we're trying to model. This is what that, that predicted contact would be in the single monomer, but it's clearly satisfied in the dimer. And so the difficulty is that you have to deconvolve the within chain and between chain contacts. And we're working on dedicated pipelines for doing that instead of ending up with the um, sort of mixture that we currently have to deal with that's, that's just getting inferred by alpha-fold multimer. So I think another big thing, and we've talked about this again and again, but I just want to illustrate why this is so important, improving the scoring functions and the quality predictions, I think is really essential. And one of the things that we learned from a lot of the cases in CAS 15 and our internal benchmarks is we're good right now at identifying bad structures. So if we look at that slide I was showing before, we can tell from the predicted TM scores, here are the good models, here are the bad models. We can easily distinguish between those. That's fine. But sometimes we're bad at identifying good structures from nearly good structures. And so this is one of the CAS-15 targets where um, it's a um, A6B2 complex. So we've got a hexameric ring of our A's. We have two of our B's. And the big challenge is where do you put these blue proteins? So here's the experimental structure. And we get three different models, which are basically all of the possible sort of ortho, meta, or para confirmations of the two blue proteins relative to each other. And our predicted TM scores do not pick the, predict co the correct combination, which would be having the two blue proteins on adjacent uh, copies of the yellow protein. And this is something that needs to be improved. And if we look just across a large set of benchmarks at in DI Taser, for example, the correlation between estimated TM score and the actual observed TM scores that we get, there's a good correlation here, but it's not good enough sometimes to distinguish between the best model and other potentially good models. And so, you know, I think it's a good question for the discussion, how do we improve these things? And it may just be that we need to get massive sets of decoys and train a new generation of deep learning based scoring functions. I'm not sure, but I think it's an important area for future development. Um, and last thing that I wanted to mention was like, how can we do use the deep learning pipelines to model conformational ensembles? My two cents about this, and I think we're gonna talk about this soon, is that doing, sort of physics-based sampling is going to be a really, really important piece of this. Um, but it may also be that if we train the deep learning pipelines to give us 
actually thermodynamically correct ensembles, then they'll be able to do it. I think the challenge we have is right now, we've got deep learning pipelines that are trained to give us the right answer, and so they give us the right answer. They're not trained to give us the correct thermodynamic ensembles of things. And so it's basically luck if we end up stumbling upon the not so great structures, which would actually be part of a disordered ensemble. Um, and perhaps trying to train to reproduce the ensembles is a way to do that. I'm actually playing with just some um, toy systems right now to see um, under what conditions you can get deep learning based pipelines to actually give you real thermodynamics um, from this kind of sampling instead of just giving you a bunch of good confirmations. I think I'll probably stop there I th I, or and address questions. Um, so let's see, or it looks like Wei's already hitting those. Wei, thank you very much. Um, all right, so I, I think we can move to discussion uh, unless anyone wants to see like what we're doing with crystallography, but that's sort of a side topic. No, no, that's that's really, really, really interesting. But, you know, in terms of your sampling, okay, you know, the physics-based sampling is usually the problem is to really the time scales and you know if you do have energy barriers between you know the different states you did that's that's a big bottleneck so the idea is you know that that i thought would be reasonable is that you know if you have evolutionary information that points you to functionally different states and you can be used you know from this from the MSA somehow, or you know, MSA together with you know with the with the, with the deep learning to get you, you know, to 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 zero in on those and help you to guide you know your your physics-based sampling in, in, in a better way. It's like you know getting to some kind of 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 latent space, right? Where you can move in moves much faster moves and then you know translate them physically into what you need. Yeah, and I think you could think about doing this iteratively also of maybe iterating back and forth between, okay, generate yes, a mass set yes, of yes. old structures and use all of them as the start of physics-based simulations. Um, yes, and if you if you would take all these alpha fold structures that are bad and you do the physics simulations on those, what what would happen, you know, which, how, is, is the... Sorry, I think my internet hiccuped. I missed the tail end of your question. I, I think it was Shushan that I think that, that you could use state. It's mine. Yeah, at least I did not hear you either. So uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Okay. So so uh, if if taking if if using physics based simulations on on these bad structures on these worst structures. The, the you know the ones that 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 have the lower lower alpha fold you know al alpha fold predicted scores could that you know kind of lead you to somehow you know if you knew how to do it smartly because it really depends you know why these scores are bad you know they may be bad just because one region is bad they may be bad they may contain you know part of the correct you know intermediate structure, you know, from which you can, that you can rescue using the physics-based method. Yeah, well, so it is difficult. Um, maybe Wei has done ablation studies on these particular cases, but this again is just one of the slides from what we had shown at um, CASP 15, but just comparing here the performance of the AlphaFold2 control method versus the um, DI taser models. And so of course, everything up in this quadrant are things that you just couldn't model with just alpha fold two and you rescue it with the full approach that we have. Yeah. I don't know. And way maybe you do for these targets is um, how much of that contribution for these targets, for example, is coming from using the better multiple sequence alignments versus how much of it is coming from the um, Marco Che Monte Carlo calculations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you certainly can see cases like what you were just talking about, where here's a good example. The alpha fold structure gets some of this protein right but some of it wrong. Right, exactly. I mean, okay this this is where it could be useful. Yeah. So, way I did you know for these targets? Did you, did you ever check into how much of this is coming from the um, different pieces? No, no. I, 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 I. These, these are what these are the. Uh, uh, no, I, I was asking way. I know. I know way. Yeah, Shang sorry, is sorry, on yeah. this call. Um, no, not yet. So we will check on the report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, this hasn't been checked, but it's an interesting question for sure. 
Let's see. I think I had another been... question. You know, you're... sorry. I'm go sorry. Ahead. I don't want go to ahead. take all the time. Go, go ahead. Sorry, you were mentioning another question. Yeah, and another question is, you know, these these you know these deep learning potentials, you know, that kind of where driven partly I and mean, what they 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 seem to how you know how how do they contribute to your you know to your some of them yeah i mean i i was just wondering i i don't know them very well i should read the papers maybe <laughs> well i mean so i i, I may not understand the question you meant. i mean how they contribute is they contribute additional terms to the um overall hamiltonian of that's get, basically getting sample I and mean, it's not really a hamiltonian but to the potential yeah. energy function yeah. that's getting sampled yeah. during the markov chain monte carlo um and so you're getting just uh distance and contact potentials. And then also in the case of one of the pipelines we're using, um, you get hydrogen bond uh, potentials right, as well. Right, you, yeah, okay. And those are kind of deep learning based. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. How so, did you weight them together? Yeah. How, how did you weight the different contributions? Did you optimize it like? Oh, yeah, way I'm blank. Way I'm blanking on the exact weighting, how that was done. I remember we talked about it and now I'm totally blanking on the answer to that question. Maybe I have it in my notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is this is really you know really interesting. It's going back and forth from these you know from these you know alpha fold type approaches and and the physics based you know sounds really very interesting. Let's see. Okay, I'm just looking through questions in the chat. I think they've mostly been addressed. I think I'm a. So I, I guess we should open it for everybody else if there are more questions or comments. I mean, there, are, there was something from, I think it's David here, David Jones in the beginning. Uh, I mean, I guess it was the, I guess it was the, I suppose, so, uh, mainly, mainly for Bjorn. It was what, um, but what was the agreement between the quality of the, of the CASP models and the final alpha fold confidence metrics? I guess, in other words, what is obvious ahead of time, which were, very good and bad models here. I guess like I mean, you have it seems like you have correlation like 0.8 or something like that. If you look at your plots in general, yeah, yeah, but yes. Like, yeah, I mean, in most of the cases, it was fairly obvious. I would say, at least in some cases, was very high. But but it's, but but you also had these cases with lower, point, maybe zero correlation. But if it, yeah, if all models are good or all models are bad, it doesn't really matter. But like yeah, yeah, you need yeah. to have yeah. I mean, it's not only correlation, but I mean, I was just looking more at the score, yes, than yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it seems mm -hmm. like, I mean, for some cases, there were, it seems like the specificity, if, if you use that term, is quite good. So if the score is high, you can trust it. But it there's probably, there are models that... Wait, but I mean, but, it, models but it looks in cases where you have like high predicted TM scores. I mean, you accept them, you have, mm. but they are called, the scores are bad. Of course, it could be an alternative confirmation, but... Yeah, I mean that's but maybe I mean, maybe was, not, yeah maybe there's a few examples like that. Maybe yeah, there's just a few examples, and then you don't really know if it's. I mean, it's hard to tell what's going on there actually. But uh, I, I guess is, the question uh, was more down to the, not the correlations, but obviously that you know mm -hmm. per target. But I don't, I didn't have a you know a clear view of what the actual CASP results were in this section. So I don't know if all your models were great. Or, or say half of them are great, and whether it was obvious with the final scores that you got for each of those that you could separate those two sets. That was the real question. It wasn't down to the sampling. Obviously, you know, there's a correlation between the score and what's the better of the models. But if the, even the best model is rubbish and you're getting a good score for that, that's less useful than if it's, you know, if abs the absolute value of the PLDT score, whichever you're using, tells you whether you've got the answer right. So it was that, it was that question really. I, and I, Sorry if it was in the talk. I just couldn't work out whether I was looking at benchmark data or CASP data, and I, you know, I don't. I'm not sure I was fully up to date on what happened in the um, assembly mm -hmm. part of CASP. So I don't know, you know, what the range of quality was of your models in CASP. If, yeah, yeah, they were really good. So yeah, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, you, it's, you are uh, talking, no, I mean, were they all? They were, were all perfect models, with, uh, more or less. Okay, well, there were there were a set of antibody targets that nobody got right. Right, very few. I mean, yeah. so there was at least the, the nanobodies. I guess the two of you maybe got right, but very few people got yeah, right. But the yeah. antibodies, I don't think anybody got right. 
So it's everyone it's 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 basically as possible. And Clovis was term. okay with you know one of the nanobodies, but I don't remember the details either. But I can look it up. Okay. I, it just says that you're telling me then that Casper, we've solved the assembly problem in Casper, basically. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm sorry. Maybe that's what you're saying. I don't know because I, that wasn't my inter that wasn't my impression of it. But no, I, I guess that's what no, definitely saying. not. I mean, I, I, I don't no, know. No, that's... but I mean, it's yeah. Well, I mean, what's what's your average to... dot cube? Yeah. yeah, I wasn't trying to you know rubbish the result. I was just trying to say you know if there were some that were bad and you knew they were bad, that's a good thing. And I just wasn't quite sure. If, you know, I'm sure they were great, but I just don't know. You know yeah, yeah, there were some that were bad, obviously. Yeah, but of 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 Bjorn's models. Yeah, yes. I yeah. Mean, yeah, and of those models that were bad, did you know they were bad before you before you got the results? Y yes. Okay. More, yeah. yeah, because because I looked at the score. I mean, it, the scores are bad. Yeah, I, yeah. I was trying to you sample to get the score, yeah. but I couldn't get any good do you, score. Do you, do you have the score? So what I would want you to know is, do you have those scores that you calculated yes. before the assessment yes. that you could plot against the final assessor's yes. yeah, assessment? That's, that's what he does. What I'd like to see. I can, I can show them here. I have a PDF here of all of them. Oh, no, that's okay. right. Sure. If, you, if you can share that, yeah. great. So, yeah, yeah, share that. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, should, should we look at now or do you want to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so here is a. Uh, yeah. Here I, I do it for all the. For this, now I divide it into these six settings. So it depends on which target you're interested in. <laughs> Overall, it's, it's not good. One, I just want your one first ranked one model. Yeah, one your, number your first target. ranked model against the docu. Okay, and uh, yeah, I don't you have, have you have you know you have already here you know something which is. <laughs> I don't have it on I mean, this computer. Here. Okay. I could I mean, have, I mean, but I didn't. I guess it's just yeah. This one, yeah. I want what for, for each cast target. I want to know what the what model. What the model, you know, what the official value was for its actual quality versus the actual value you managed to reach in your sampling for that model. I guess that's just uh, just to see yeah. across the targets whether you have an absolute guide as to whether to draw the line between the good models and the bad models. I guess that was, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. That was just. Uh, I remember mean, what, what I, uh, if I remember correctly, basically there was three or four antibody targets with nobody good at. And then, of course, when we have been benchmarking. I mean, just for normal FFO, you have a correlation like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 between predicted docu and and the docu. So mm -hmm. that's it. It's not what, perfect, but it's. Uh, what, do you know? I mean, what was the PLDDT score that, or whichever which one we were using for this, for the antibody targets that couldn't be modeled? I guess that's the question. The PLDDT score for each individual chain is very high, but yes. the, if you look, but, but if you try to predict the the interface, so each of the monomers are perfect, but right. it, but the docking is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, if you, so the PLT is not a good metric interface. unless you focus on, you had to but sort of like look at but, interface only. Okay, but Bjorn must have used a metric to find that complex, the antibody complex. Uh, the, so that's the ranking confidence. Yeah. So in, that com is, in, that in those particular cases, he should have ended up with a bad score. Yeah, I, yes. I, I hope so. Yeah, but he, yes. he, he did in, many, in a number of cases, he did, right? So that's yeah, that's the question though, because it needs you know, it relative is interesting, but yeah, yeah. absolute quality is really if you're going to automate this, mm -hmm. you, know, you need to know when it's a good model or when it's a bad model without actually having the results. And that's the that that's that was what I was interested in finding out. Okay, um, while you I, I just did the, the plot on the other excellent. computer, so now it now it's here. <laughs> this, this is the result for the this is the ranking confidence versus the doc, the quality score. For, for the cast targets. Okay, these are all just single cast. Okay, that's what I wanted to see. Yeah. For, for some of them, but it's uh, oh, it's okay. not. Well, some I think that's what. Else. But that looks pretty bad. But I don't I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I did it wrongly. Yeah. The 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 it looks like many bad models, that, but I predict the correlation is quite good. But it looked like you only could predict one third of the targets. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a bit yes. clearer at least. I mean, I, you know, I guess it's closer to. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I, I was quickly made. I may, I may have made a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> well, no, so, I mean, I don't. You know, I just it's just kind of. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's worth. It's worth. You know, I guess it's just kind of an interesting question. Yeah, I think. It's, it's it's really worth you know uh, doing the, the statistics right and, and and seeing you know what the general trends are you know mm. in terms mm. of of these predicted you know scores and see how good they are and then why you know why they are bad they may be as i said before they may be bad because of you know part for the, they may be bad because of the iptm or they may be bad because of the of of the ptm 
So which, which one is it? The IPTM, you know, you can get similar or non near native structures, which, you know, as soon as you have a different interface, it's a doc queue is wrong. So I think this is also merits to have a look at because it can be, can tell you something because, you know, the uh, uh, non-physiological interfaces are sometimes, you know, uh, the same protein, in other words, can make non-physiological interfaces in the crystal and, and, and the actually physiological interfaces as well. And I say this because we derived recently a benchmark, you know, of, of, of uh, homodimers, for example, and uh, benchmarks which we have physiological and non-physiological interfaces with very similar interface areas. And uh, the, the non-physiological interfaces were selected as those that are never observed, but the same protein can make physiological interfaces as well. So you have a competition here that is, you know, in between interfaces that is really hard, you know, to distinguish with, with any scoring functions. But, you Andre? know, the story about this is, is quite interesting, actually, because some scoring functions and combinations of scoring functions that people have developed are really, really doing well to distinguish these two types of interfaces, much better than, you know, individual scoring functions or what we call raw scores. Okay, I think uh, Andre. Yeah, I, I wanted to raise an issue that, that we ran into uh, while looking at um, multiple scoring functions for uh, for models, and and we saw this with ASGI, and also we analyzed with John because some functions that we uh, check the quality versus them are not that perfect if we have more than two interfaces, one, more than one interface, more than two mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. subunits. For example, we notice that there are some models in CAST that have big interfaces for assemblies and then tiny interfaces between these assemblies. So it's assembly of assemblies, you know. And then if you look at the model, model looks horrible to an eye. But interface scores are all perfect. Or for example, mm -hmm. TM score, right? TM score, we notice that for large structures that we had in CASP, this D0 parameter is very important that goes into the TM score and TM score fails badly. Or LDDT score, right? So if you look at LDDT scores for uh, uh, situations when you have uh, small interfaces and big interfaces, and even if you weight these interfaces and do doc Q score, it's also not perfect. So I just want to say, you know, as Bjorn pointed out, you know, you have correlation, but correlation is not everything. And some part of this, you know, of truth to this is that the scoring functions in the end are not perfect for all cases. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we should try to wrap it up. This in yes. good comments and interesting discussion. So, like, in one month, we have uh, roughly we have a, meet, uh, a seminar by Tommy Jakola. So this is uh, certainly uh, not directly cast because of diffusion models. I think I, mean, I, I, I don't know if you want to talk. I mean, has, I mean, the major work is basically one is the they have a like and binding predictor using deep learning, using diffusion models that seems at least in the benchmark seems really, really good because diff doc. Uh, and they have um, also uh, a part of the diffusion for protein generation, so generating uh, protein backbone confirmations that you then can use uh, another method for uh, designing sequences that also looks really good. So they, exactly what it's going to talk about, but we focus on diffusion models and it's going to be talk about uh, uh, how these are influencing our work. So, I mean, that's, um, I think it's going to be really exciting because it's really what's happening in the, in, the, in, my, in the machine learning field. And I think that I mean, another thought I had is like we actually probably we need another session. Maybe we have, we have time for more discussions. Maybe we should try to have that in, in two months. But that's, um, uh, uh, but we can take that discussion if you're going to have that offline. So if you have any comments about that, email me or email on the, or put it on the mailing list or in the Discord channel. I guess that the Discord channel is what we should try to get more people to use because that's what the CASP official discussion forum is. It's quite silent. So that's... Uh, any other comments about the next future meetings or feedback? I would really appreciate it. 
I mean, of suggestions or speakers or whatever. It's just I mean, put in the chat, send me an email or send. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think I do have one, you know, for later on. And anyway, thanks to the speakers. It was really great that they addressed the questions and that was, you know, very interesting. Thank you. I, I agree. I think it was really good. And I think we were like 60 people here. So there was uh, a Wonderful. bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think and the main analysis is about maybe, how... You know, talk about benchmarks. You know, we have a benchmark data set that we developed and, you know, we can we can have a look at this and this if, if this is really useful to you or, you know, to Peter. Yes. I mean, it would be really nice to have something to... <laughs> the testing mm -hmm. else because mm -hmm. it's it's hard when you have to know biology and you can't just go to the B, B, PDB for your gold standard. Like, <laughs> things start moving. Uh, I mean this, yeah, this this is why I get to biology. <laughs> it is important. <laughs> but you know what you did is great and really interesting. Continue to to look at this. Okay. Okay. So, I, I would post the uh, it's one final message here, but just uh, could someone send a link to the Discord channel? I don't know. I guess I can if I find it. Uh, uh, how do I get linked to it? Uh, I think we have it somewhere. Does anyone know where to find it? Uh, how do I get the link to the Discord channel? Mm. Isn't it on the CAS 15 website? Yeah, yeah, it's on the website. You're right. Yeah. Um. Or, or in my, I think I have it on my. Uh, there I have it. Uh, uh, I have my website. Copy, copy link. I found it, I think. I think this one should work. I mean, if someone can try it. Yeah. See if you've got the same link that I've got. Okay, you got, yeah. It's, yeah you yes. have an, someone has an invite in it, but it's just not the same. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, this code is a bit complicated. If I click my link, I end up on. Not sure. I'm, I guess I've just copied the one from the website it looks yeah, i'm not really sure i try one of these links it's, it's, the invite one looks like that i guess but um yeah that's the one from the fifth uh from the cast i think the one the first one is for discord dynamics or something dynamics the other one is okay. for the yeah, something yeah so yeah you, you have a few to change <laughs> <Can't> try them <laughs> try a few yeah. try a few of those and uh, you'll get there it's a bit this might this might explain why there's nobody actually commenting on the uh on the discord yeah, channel. yeah. 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 I, I i had to re reinstall the computer and it took me like a day to get all the discord channels back it was really a pain because you had to verify every email every time it was a pain <laughs> it's like yeah okay but uh i will post the um, uh, video as soon as it's ready and then send a link to it Okay, thanks again, Peter and Shoshana and Björn. Yes, thanks, everyone. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Great. Take Bye. care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.